Grace has been the most gracious client we've ever had. It's very uh, good. By the way, this is a dialogue, so at the end we'll have a time for conversation. This is probably going to be 20, 30, 25 minutes at the most, 30 at the very most, and then we'll have time for uh, conversation. That's what this is about. And then we have refreshments, which is looking forward to that, too. Okay. So often when you're invited into someone's house, they don't expect that you're going to rip the walls apart. <laughs> the project was really interesting. Uh, Nina was asked initially, as she's a paintings conservator, to look at, at the paintings. Can they be ser saved? Can they be removed? And then Nina suggested that I come on board. I'm an objects conservator, so um, moving things and taking things off walls and treating objects is not foreign to me. <clears throat> and the third part is Scott Mosier, who's a third part of our team, who is really great hands and heads. He's phenomenal uh, woodworker by, and just manager and problem solver. So we worked really well together and the three of us ended up um, addressing the project. So I'm calling this Removing Alice because we're taking her out of one location and eventually she's going to be relocated just down the hall. So the first question I had was, we've got something that was created in 1932 and it's on drywall, gypsum board. We know that from the 20s, even up into the 80s, the 1980s, there may be asbestos in it. So if we're going to end up doing cutting or creating dust, we're in someone's house. We're human beings and we don't want to, we don't want to end up breathing things. So we, I went into the rabbit hole and, <laughs> and sampled the, the drywall without compromising any of the artwork because everything was covered. So. That went off, the lab came back, no asbestos. That's a good thing that makes life much easier. First part is documenting. It's part of our, we, as a professional members in AIC, which is the Institute of Conservation for Artistic, uh, Historic and Artistic Works of Art, we are bound in, by this code of ethics. And so one of the things we have to do is documentation. It includes written images, written information, and, and visual images. So here's Nina at her, at her iPad um, making copious notes. Here's Scott starting to dismantle. So the first thing we needed to do was remove the moldings. And we knew that we were going to, from day one, you know, I, when I was talking to Jan and the other Manhatters, that this room is the gestalt of these objects. You could take the paintings off the wall and still have them, but it's that space because of the low cons configuration of the ceiling you walk in, and as adults, you feel like giants. And as kids, you feel like, like giants um, because it's a whole different sense of sensibility. So that room had to stay intact. So it meant every part of the room became part of the artifact. So first of all, numbering everything and removing pieces individually. And there's Nina and Scott moving. And, and I was involved also, but I'm, when I'm saying to Nina, I'm always taking pictures. So This room is four feet, two inches tall at the far yeah. of the wall. Yeah, when it drops down. Um, I, you can tell by the bumps on our we, heads. We bumped our head a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a good indication of, of the condition, and Nina's going to talk about this more, but you know, you've got this where you've got a joint of several pieces of, of wall. You've got moisture problems because this is a section between the two windows and there was water damage at one point. Um, you can see flaking and lifting paint, and you can see the dimensionality of the paint and the opacity of the paint. So the first thing that had to be done was consolidation before we'd even start to think of removing them from the walls. And, and again, Nina will go into more detail, but here she is doing localized, and here we ended up taking turns uh, applying a consolidant to help um, create a more stable material. So when we take them off, the paint stays on the walls and not on the floor. We also, because this is 19, 1932, um, all these panels were nailed in place. You know, currently we use, you know, normally screws, right? Um, drywall screws. And these are flat-headed flat nails, uh, which have been in place since 1932, so they oxidize. When they oxidize, they bond with the wood, so it makes it really difficult to remove it. So we ended up creating a couple of things. One was finding all the nails, and there, look, there's a nail we didn't even know about. <laughs> um, so we're using a rare earth magnet where, where there's painted surfaces and where we expect to find the nails and then we could mark them. Then we would remove them mechanically 
um, either with uh, a pry system, especially when it's out near the edges. Um, and when it was in the painted areas, we would use a drill with a, um, think of a, it's a tubular core, drill bit. Core drill. Yeah, mm -hmm. a core drill, and it's, um, it's a diamond bit on the end, and so we could drill through and take out the least amount of material. Mm. So you, you pull the panels off over the nails that way? No. You no. pull the nails out after you yeah. drilled them out? Yeah, because okay. yeah, then way you could grab a hold of them and get them out or snap them off. And so you can see there's, there's a combination of joints that some of them had been filled and painted. Um, you can find nails that are visible, nails that are not so visible. And then some of these panels fit together and there was just the normal part of the drywall and other ones had to be cut. And so that's the other reason why we wanted to know if there's asbestos, because if we're cutting them, we needed to capture all the dust and that would create a whole different scenario for closing off that space. So once the nails were out, we were able to remove the panels one at a time, take them to a table in the middle of the room. The next, le the next stage was uh, Nina consolidating corners, edges, surfaces, and I, I would also help with building up some of these dimensional pieces, the object side. Um, and here's an example of the room after we've removed the panels. Here's the, um, the rabbit hole, and Alice was standing over Here. by the door, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right there. Um, there's another Alice image that she was standing here, but you can see the panels that were below the, the painted area we left in place. We thought that can be replicated. That's not the artistic side. Um, also, what was interesting is we had to get them out of the upstairs bedroom, <laughs> down the stairs, crated into this building, and they wintered over here. So um, Scott came up with this idea of using um, a aluminum-faced foam, foam board. Um, we closed off the edges with uh, metallic tape, and then we he designed three different sizes so that we could gang these pieces together because everything had been measured and we could figure out what was going to go together in terms of space, not in terms of visual uh, relationships. And so here they are with blocks of foam that had been hot glued in place. And um, those are the waiting ones. We had one area where before we finished, we had to get the radiator out because we had to get behind it to get Alice and to get the painting over here. So this slowed us down a little bit, but because of Grace's connection with the community, when, <laughs> when they knew it was Grace's house, they were there. It was great. No, like, no like leaking, eight o'clock the next morning. Yeah, no yeah. leaking water, he no said, problems. I have, I have five houses that are freezing up, but I'm here. It was also really cold yeah. and snowy. Yeah. <laughs> and so here it is. Let's move to the side, and that's, I believe, going to the it's, it's, it's been put back. Yeah, it's reattached. And so here's the walls. Um, so we've got this following the, what we were doing, removing the, wall, the wood trim, and this is after remov removal and the gypsum board and paintings, and then the areas that are remained that were not something we were going to remove. So this is kind of process and final. <clears throat> the one thing we didn't remove, and you realize around the door and around the, um, the little hole down the rabbit hole was all wood panel, wood pan pieces that had been um, faux painted for wood. So this remained, but we've taken measurements and these will be replicated. The other pieces we were able to remove and will go into the, the relocated room. All the panels ended up um, being staged at one point in the bed, in Grace's bedroom upstairs, and, and she was kind enough to give up her bed. Notice and the phone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Timestamp. Yeah. That was in case we had an emergency. But everything, everything went well. Everything, these are all wrapped so we can take them down, crate them, and then move them into this building. Um, we needed, because of the fragility of the panels, so it's gypsum board from the 19, 1930s uh, with paper facing. We needed to find a, a system that we could bond to the backside to give them stability. And I would ask you not to touch this, but if you look behind Alice, you'll we see. We have a photo too. Yeah, they'll see the panels. The panels have been reattached. So this will stay in place. And this is the material that's been bonded to the backside of the gypsum board that will, that will help to support uh, the pieces. It's aluminum faced, and this one happens to be painted, but we use. Hard to Yeah, just as a straight textured. Um, aluminum and 
the center is a, um, a thick inflexible polyethylene, so it's all archival and will give us easily 50 years of, of health and safety for the, for the pieces. And that's it. Grace was kind enough to let Alice be removed from the house. <laughs> So Ron and I, of course, were super busy this week and didn't um, uh, share our talk, so there's some repetition, but I will just go quickly over um, the parts that are very similar. So I, of course, decided to call my talk Moving One Way. <coughs> so the first step um, was the preparation for removal. And because this um, was kind of an unusual project, moving an entire room, um, Ron and I spent a lot of time uh, brainstorming materials and methods and um, it was really great to have a team to work with. So this is what the, um, what the room looked like. And in December, in, until December 2018, the Alice Room and the Burley Home in Wayne, Maine looked like this. Perhaps many of you even visit it for story hour. Removing and reinstalling the, an entire room is a huge job with any complex conservation or construction project. You can plan all you want, but there will be surprises and possible catastrophes. There, there haven't been catastrophes yet. So I decided there's no way that I would take this uh, project on by myself, but luckily, and I can't believe I'm saying this, 18 years ago, I worked on a project of moving the um, dioramas within the state house from the, from the old state house building to the connector tunnel. Ron and I met on that project when he hired me to come in and work on that job. I know it was 18 years ago because I was pregnant with my daughter. <laughs> he was a senior in high school now. We also worked with Scott Mosier, who is, um, who was, he's retired now, but he was the preparator at the Maine State Museum. And so the three of us had worked together as a team and we knew that we got along, although we'd never worked in such a small space. I have to say that. And we also have all, never bumped our heads so many times. <laughs> So, yeah. So we met throughout the fall and in December, because that's the most convenient time to do something like this, right before Christmas, we got together and did the project. So Ron touched on this, but one of the things we did was we labeled all of the trim. So you can see the numbers here. So every single, num every single piece of trim is documented and labeled, and we wrote on the back of the trim with a Sharpie so um, it can be reinstalled by someone other than us or even us. And this may seem like a crazy overkill thing to do, but let me tell you, after you take the first set of trim down and you wrap it up, you can't remember where it went. So it was really good that we did this. Um, after we took the trim down, we also labeled the panels. So you can see here, this is the space where the trim was. So we were able to write on each of those with a pencil and labeled the panels as well. Ron touched on consolidating the surface. Um, once all the trim was removed and the panels um, were labeled, we started doing some, some more thorough testing on the surface of the painting. And to everyone's chagrin, we discovered that the paintlers were extremely water soluble and friable. And for those of you who don't know what friable means, friable means like powdering and, and, um, and, and uh, powdering when you touch it or rub it, kind of like um, makeup is friable or pastels. It's not something you really want in a paint layer, um, mm. especially if you're going to be moving it. Mm. <laughs> and because the paint layers were going to be um, exposed to a little bit more stress and strain during the removal process, we decided we wanted to do something to um, to protect them. So what we did is uh, what conservators called consolidation, which is basically just the application of really, really dilute adhesives or glues. The tricky thing about this kind of paint surface, and you can see it in the flesh right here, is that it is very matte, and when you use um, when you add anything to it, you can change the surface reflectance and make it shiny. And if you've ever taken a, be a pebble home from the beach, you know the difference between what matte and shiny looks like. If you find it in the water and it looks amazing and it's like beautiful black and white specks, and you take it out and it dries off in your pocket on the way home, it's just like this flat gray thing. That's the difference between something being matte or wet in and shiny. Um, this paint 
is inherently matte, so we don't want it to look shiny. If we, if we were to wet it in, it would look um, actually very transparent and you would see the backing of the, um, of the paper much, much more. So we, what we did is we uh, sprayed it with a material called methyl cellulose, which is, uh, retains a matte surface but that material is also water soluble. So when I took them home to my studio, I actually sprayed them with another substance that is a little bit more sturdy and is soluble in alcohol, but it's also very smelly, so we didn't want to do it on site in Grayson's house. <laughs> so here's the scary part, and I will be honest that I, also, I don't have any pictures of us doing this part, and Ron didn't show any either, because we were always just pulling out the nails with the pliers and hoping for the best. <laughs> So, but the first thing we did is we actually, um, I'll show you this video, we actually trimmed the bottom half of the panels off. Let's see if we can. And you can see he's, he's um, the sound doesn't work, but he's doing a sawzall and Ron is vacuuming up the bottom edge of the panel. So for those of you who haven't been in the room, the bottom edge from like the, from like the kind of chair rail down was this kind of faux white stucco and we decided that we were gonna leave that in place and just so it would be easier to have less wall to deal with. Um, so we cut that off and then removing the nails. Ron showed um, how we located some of the nails with the rear earth magnets, the ones we couldn't see. And then the ones that are, so it's their nails along each side of the panel here and the ones that were within an image, we used this um, bore um, drill bit to take them out because when you pull the nail out with the, um, with the pliers, very often everything went well, but sometimes the head of the nail caught on the paper and caused a rip or an abrasion, which is okay on the unpainted parts, but if that happens on the painted part and it starts to rip, you really don't know kind of how long or how far it's gonna go. So we knew we were gonna lose a tiny bit of the paint, to, of the paint around the, the nail hole, but we knew it was completely consistent with each hole and that we could repair it later. Um, once the pan here's a picture of them actually pulling out the first panel and there it is um, on its back in the other room and um, this panel had a little bit of damage in the corner so we actually anything that fell out that we could find we glued back in over here and then as you know the edge of um, drywall is very powdery and fragile and especially older drywall is even worse and then the fresh cut edges were also very powdery so we sealed them all um, with a material, there's a picture of me doing it, sealed them all with a material called Roplex AC33, which you don't need to know, but it's very similar. It's an acrylic dispersion. It's very similar to Elmer's glue, except that it wicks in and is runnier, so it actually penetrates deeper into porous materials. So this is sort of what it looks like behind the walls, and this was an amazing find. We found this. It's uh, a postcard uh, mounted onto a very thin, like tin, and it's um, a picture of the Methodist Church, um, I don't think it was, was it in Fayette? I don't think it was. And the picture of the minister that was inside the wall in like this little time capsule. So Grace actually has it at her house. Um, just wrapping for storage, we wrapped each of the pieces up in these, um, this inner, so when we originally wrapped this, we didn't really know how long it would be in storage. Um, I will admit that I didn't think the community would be moving so quickly at the reinstallation, so this is actually a treat, because often you do these projects, you're like, well, we'll wrap it up and we'll raise money and it'll be there for a year or maybe 20, but it seems like it's gonna be faster. Um, the conservation treatment of the panels is the next phase, and this, has, this is ongoing, but happened over the summer as well, and this is the first batch of panels arrived at my house in spring. But before we could do any, any um, actual conservation of the panels, um, Ron and I did mock-ups because this is such an unusual treatment. And Ron touched on the material that we used, but the other thing we needed to figure out was um, what we were gonna do, how we were gonna attach the panels to the dye bond. And um, we needed an adhesive that was super strong, so it could have, have uh, maintain the weight and also was able to work in a wide range of temperatures. So I did some initial research and then I spent a long time on the phone with 3M and um, got some amazing um, um, advice from them and we, together with uh, their consultants and testing, we decided to, I'm using something called Scotchwell 2261, which is an epoxy that is often used in the aerospace industry and cryogenic. So it has a um, temperature range of like, 
200 and something degrees to negative 40. So any, any sort of on earth conditions it will be okay for. Um, it also has an open time of 90 minutes. So that allows you to place the panels down and register them, move them around. Um, I haven't done any of the complex ones yet, but there are several that have many, pan many pieces in one image. Um, so during the mock-up process, we discovered the hardest part of working with this was mixing the adhesive together. But I invested in a mixing gun. That is, uh, it's this gun and this cartridge, and you just put the cartridge on and pull the trigger, and it comes out in these little lines like there's a place where it's exposed Whoa. right there. It comes out in perfect little lines and it's super easy to do. So that was an investment that was well worth it. When you're working on such a big project, it's really great to find these time savers. Conservators often feel that they can't take any shortcuts, they have to make everything themselves, so they're cheating. But on this project, I decided to let that go. <laughs> and so in, that, in light of that, I also had a custom color mixed up for this blue background. There's tons of this blue background and it's this matte paint. It's very hard to match matte surface reflectance. So Golden Acrylics, which is a company that makes artist grade acrylic paints, also will do custom color matches um, for um, conservators. So they actually made this up. So I have a whole jar of what I call Alice Blue and I used it on that. It works great. And it also will allow me to do touch-ups on site after we reinstall because all those holes we, we drilled out, a lot of them are in this blue color. So this is just an idea of what Alice looked like when she arrived at my studio on, um, on the crate with the little bumpers in between each. I've also done those two other panels, the Cheshire Cat and the Drink Me. This is how Alice spends her time. She has to cure. So 90 minutes open time means as soon as you get everything um, together, you have to have nine, at least 90 minutes of it being weighted so that it doesn't move around and squish. And then this epoxy actually takes a full week to fully cure, but you can move it around after the first 90 minutes. So here Alice is after treatment, and that's what she looks like on the back. After treatment. And you can see she's got like a neighbor sitting on another woman. <laughs> Thank you.